if you will. Turn in your Bibles to the 11th chapter, the Gospel of uh, Mark, for our text uh, here this morning. It is time for Jesus to make his triumphal entry. It will begin the final week of his earthly ministry here upon this uh, planet. And, and now Jesus' popularity is at an all-time uh, high. The crowds, wherever Jesus goes, they are massive. You remember that shortly before his triumphal entry that Jesus had been called to Bethany, to the house of Mary and Martha, where Lazarus, his good friend, lay sick. And you remember that by the time that Jesus got there, Lazarus had been in the tomb for three days already. And Mary and Martha are there and and so are a crowd of mourners that are from Jerusalem and from that surrounding area. And you remember that Jesus calls Lazarus forth from the grave. It was a stunning miracle to see Lazarus stagger out of that grave in his grave clothes and to be helped off with them, restored back to life and placed back in the home with Mary and Martha. But what's significant about it was that it was done in the presence of those who were from Jerusalem. And they took and spread that story to everybody in Jerusalem. Most of Jesus' miracles and the time that he spent teaching was in Galilee, in the northern section, away from the, uh, the heart uh, of the nation, which was in Jerusalem. And so now the entire city was abuzz with this Jesus who, who had raised Lazarus uh, from the dead. So concerned were the religious leaders because so many were now beginning to believe that Jesus was the Messiah that they were even plotting to put Lazarus to death again, which I don't think is a really good idea <laughs> when he was already raised once from the dead. <laughs> And so Jesus withdraws from the crowds, heads to Ephraim and departs, and, and he waits until it is his time. But this is now his time. Jesus begins by heading through Jericho, and you'll remember that he heals the blind men there in Jericho and departs. The disciples, they are fearful. The religious leaders have put out the the news that if you even see Jesus, you're to let us know where he is, that we might apprehend him. And, and so the disciples uh, now are, are concerned about Jesus as he is heading towards Jerusalem. But Jesus sets his face like flint. He will head directly into the maelstrom. Jerusalem was the seat of authority and power. It's where the Sanhedrin resided. It's where the chief priests and the high priests dwelt. And, and that was the, the center of the opposition that was against Jesus. But in the city itself, it was ablaze with a single question. The single question that everybody was talking about. I mean, every single person you talked to was being asked the same question. What do you think? Do you think that he is uh, the Messiah? Could the Messiah actually be here? And the, the second question was this. With the religious leaders wanting to arrest him, do you think he'll show up? Do you think that he'll be here at the, the feast? Do you think that he'll slip in and, and kind of stay in the outskirts? And, and so this was the talk. This is what everybody was buzzing about. Jesus now heads up from Jericho and, and ascends up to Bethany. Bethany is the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And, and Jesus and the disciples will stay there. It's about two miles due east of the city. And, and the pattern of Jesus during this final week will be that he will enter into the city during the daytime. And then he will withdraw back to Bethany and, and stay there in the, in the night. And so Jesus arrives there in Bethany with his disciples, and, and it is now Sunday, Palm Sunday. 
It is the day upon which Jesus is going to present himself publicly to the nation as the Messiah. And he will either be welcomed or he will be rejected. And so Mark's gospel in verse 1 says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And so Bethphage is about halfway in between Bethany and Jerusalem. And so it's about a mile out inside. Jesus and his disciples, they set out from Bethany and, and they stop outside of this village there in Bethphage. He, he grabs two of his disciples and, and he said to them, go into the village opposite you and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. Jesus knew that the religious leaders were going to arrest him and condemn him and mock him and scourge him and deliver him over to the Romans to be crucified. Yet he had the courage to now enter into Jerusalem. Not just to enter privately, but to enter it in as public a fashion as was impossible. And so Jesus now gets to Bethphage and, and sends two of the apostles in. You're going to find a cult upon which no one has sat. Mark tells us that it has never been ridden. Matthew adds that you're going to find the mother tied up with her. And if anybody objects to your taking of them, just simply say that the Lord has need of it. Jesus needed the colt. He didn't need it because he was tired and needed to sit upon it. He needed it in order to fulfill the prophecy that had been written by Zechariah. Zechariah, 500 years earlier, had declared that the Messiah is going to come. Your promised king is going to come. And he will come humbly and he will come riding upon a colt. And so Jesus stops to go and to have that colt brought into him. Matthew's gospel tells us that there were two overriding purposes that Jesus was always seeking to fulfill. Number one was the will of the Father. I do always do those things that please him. He was completely submitted to the will of the Father at all times. And secondly, to fulfill the prophecies. The prophecies were written, contained in the Old Testament, are a portrait of the Messiah that God had painted. That when the Messiah comes, you will be able to recognize him as he fulfills all of them. You'll remember that Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. Not one dot, not one tittle of prophecy is going to remain unfulfilled, all of it will be completed. And so Jesus now sends the two apostles into Bethphage. It's interesting that he doesn't name who they are. I want to know. <laughs> I think it's Peter and John. That, that, that's who I'm counting on here. Peter and John are always paired up together. And, and so, you know, he, he sends them off. And the other thing that I want is, I want to know the conversation between the two of them as Jesus sends them into the town. Just go into the town. You're going to find a donkey tied up with his mom. Just take him. Don't even ask. Just take him. And if anybody stops you, just tell them that I need it. Okay, Jesus. <laughs> Peter, how did we get this assignment uh, here? And in they go. I mean, it would be like Jesus and telling you, I want you to head down to the strip, and I want you to just start looking in all the cars till you find one that has the keys in them. <laughs> And then when you find a car with the keys in them, just take it and bring it to me. If anybody stops you while you're trying to steal their car, just tell them I need it. All right, Lord, let, let's go. And, and we see here that this is another one of those times when Jesus is stretching them to walk by faith and not by sight. 
to do something that just doesn't make mm, sense to them. Just go and take it. Why wouldn't we just knock on the door, Peter, and tell him my master has need of it? And no, just you take it. And if somebody stops you, here's what you are to say. And, and Jesus is continuing to prepare them for his departure. He's got one final week to build into them all of the, the final touches that he is going to have upon them before he departs. And, and so Jesus is concerned with their faith, with their trusting, where God guides, God provides. And so here we see the provision that is going to accompany now what God has called them to. But they are going to have to walk by faith. They are going to have to exercise their trust that that provision is going to come when they need it. It's true of them and it's true of us. God is trying to stretch your faith. God is going to ask you to do things that don't make sense. He's going to invite you into the journey of strengthening your faith. And he who's faithful in the little things to him, what? More is going to be given. And so and here we see this exercise of, uh, of their faith. And so they went their way, verse 4, and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there and said to them, what are you doing, loosing the colt? It was their worst fear, right? <laughs> We're going to take the colt, and hey, here comes the owner barging out of the, hey, what are you doing, stealing my animals? And here they are now in the exact situation that they were concerned with. And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. And so they let them go. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it. We see that they didn't uh, understand uh, now that they were fulfilling prophecy. They didn't even know which one, the mother or the colt, that Jesus was going to ride. In fact, they put their clothes on both of them so that Jesus now would be able to choose. And, and Jesus now sits upon that colt. Matthew tells us, and this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus now begins to come to the city in fulfillment of the scriptures. Zechariah had written this prophecy 500 years before these events are taking place. But uh, Jesus comes uh, sitting on a colt, now in humility, yet with appropriate dignity, as now the Prince of Peace is, is entering into Jerusalem. John's Gospel tells us that the disciples did not know that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. They were just in the moment. They were just being obedient to whatever the Lord was telling them. John says, therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. And for this reason, also, uh, the people came out to meet him because they had heard uh, that he had done this sign. And so the stirring there in the uh, city itself and, and yet uh, the disciples are just along with Jesus. Jesus begins now to approach the city and, and verse 8 says, And many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and, and spread them on the road. And all this was done to honor Jesus as he is making this triumphal entry into the city. The carrying of palms and branches was emblematic of victory and of success and, and of a great welcome. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so 
Here we see that Jesus, as he is now approaching, begins to come down the slope, the descent now of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a ridge and it descends down sharply right in front of Jerusalem and and cuts down into what is known as the Kidron Valley. And then there is a sharp ascent back to the Temple Mountain where the temple would sit. Jesus is now on the descent of the Mount of Olives. And and now it says that there are, are those that were before him and those who followed. So there are two crowds here. John's gospel tells us more clearly that what happened was that as they are approaching the city, word had run ahead into the city that the one that had raised Lazarus from the dead, he is on his way here right now. Jesus is approaching the city and everybody empties out of the city to come and to meet Jesus. Now, Jesus is descending with the crowd that is behind him. And so these two crowds converge over there on the Mount of Olives. And the Hosannas begin to ring forth the messianic titles of son of David and blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. And and so we see that there was just this open adoration of Jesus as the Messiah. And so the people are now declaring that question that they had been asking one another as to who do you think that he is? The people now, the crowd, is declaring the uh, hosannas to the son of David. They are worshiping him and welcoming him now uh, as uh, the Messiah. They were about to celebrate the Passover. The Passover is the backdrop to these events. Now, remember that the Passover celebrated them being liberated as slaves from Egypt and being brought into their nation, into their land. But what better time than now for the Messiah to liberate them from the slavery that they were under with the Romans. And so another setting free, another messianic deliverance here. And so the Hosannas, save us, Messiah, deliver us. But Jesus didn't come to conquer Rome. Jesus came to conquer sin and to conquer death and to set up his kingdom. And so the the crowds now are singing their hosannas. The crowd that had come out from Jerusalem with the people also came the Pharisees and the religious leaders who were seeking Jesus. And when they heard that he was approaching the city, they mingled with the crowd and they came out. They were listening to the crowd declare son of David, Messiah, and the exaltation, the palm branches that were being waved, and they were offended. And so they declare and they tell Jesus to stop this procession and stop receiving their adoration. Stop receiving their declaration that you are the Messiah. Stop misleading them. Luke's gospel said that some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I would like to hear that. (laughs) The big boulders with their baritone and the tiny pebbles hitting the high notes and and all of the rocks of Jerusalem singing out in praise and, and adoration for if the Lips of men would not praise the Lord on this day, then the very rocks, nature itself, will declare the glory of God. Jesus begins now his final approach into the city. And and as he turns the corner, the city of Jerusalem comes into view, the temple itself. It is spectacular when you are in Jerusalem and you are descending the Mount of uh, Olives that that there is a a moment when you are elevated on the Mount of Olives, the descent into the Kidron and then back up and then to the Temple Mount itself, that you are about eye level to where the Temple would have sat. 
And Jesus turns the corner, and here is the temple, the glorious house of God, the place upon this earth where God put his finger. Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. All of it he created. But upon this earth, there was one place that God put his finger, and he said, this is is where I will manifest myself to mankind. This is where my presence will be experienced. This is where my glory will dwell. And it will dwell in the very temple itself, and it will be in the Holy of Holies, and it will be there at the mercy seat that my Shekinah presence will manifest itself. Solomon had built the first temple. You remember David wanted to, but Solomon was the one that actually built it, and then he dedicated it to the Lord. And as the people were there and the sacrifices were being offered, as the prayers were being made, and as the temple was being dedicated to God, the Shekinah glory of God, kapow, moves right into the Holy of Holies. It fills the place with smoke. The priests have to run out of the temple because of God's presence now, had entered in. It was a glorious moment. And there, the whole world could come to approach God. There was the court of the men, and there was the court of the women, and there was the court of the Gentiles, where everybody could come. If you had a need, if you needed to press close to God, you could come to Jerusalem, and you could come to the very place where God said that you can approach me. Jesus turns the corner, and here is the very temple itself. Herod had been undergoing an incredible beautification project, and, and he had taken the rebuilt temple that had been built after they came back from Babylon, and, and he had put marble, white marble, all around the entire, and coated it, stood 120 feet and tall and, and then put gold all over. It was said that when the sun shone on it, it was so bright and gleaming that you couldn't even hardly look at it. It was so beautiful and magnificent. Jesus turns the corner and, and here's his father's house. Here's the temple the place where God's glory would manifest. It was the pride of the nation. Can you imagine that you, amongst all the nations of the world, had the very place where God said, I will dwell upon the face of the earth? And as the people are singing their hosannas, and, and as they are crying out, the son of David, and Jesus turns the corner and he sees the temple, he begins to weep. We find Jesus weeping only two times in the scriptures. First time was at the tomb of Lazarus, where he encountered just the wave of grief, the sorrow, the suffering that death causes, that separation and loss of relationship, the destruction of families and marriages and the bonds of relationship that, that you endure, and the empathy in Jesus and the compassion in Jesus. Though he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he weeps over the pain that sin and death causes here as he comes into full view of, of the temple, we find him weeping again. Luke's gospel records Jesus saying, if you had known, even you especially, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. The time of your visitation. You, you should have known it. 
the scriptures declared it. The portrait of Christ was, was clear in the Old Testament. The whole entire Old Testament is, is nothing more than that portrait of the Savior of the world beginning all the way in Genesis at the fall and the, the promise that he is going to come and all of the details that are given throughout that are written by the prophets. You remember Moses? Remember when Moses, after leading the children of Israel out and leading them through the desert, the the people are grumbling and complaining because they're thirsty. And, and God tells Moses to go out and to speak to the rock and it will bring forth water. But Moses is frustrated with the people and, and he goes out and he takes his rod and he smites the rock. But that was the second time that Moses smites the rock. And the rock is a typology of Jesus Christ. And Christ is only smitten. He's only crucified one time. He's not smitten a second time. And so God says to Moses, Moses, you, what are you doing? You, you've destroyed the typology that I'm building, the portrait of the Messiah in the Old Testament through your actions, and now you have marred the portrait. And because of that, Moses is not allowed to enter in to the promised land. That's how serious God was about the portrait of his son that is contained in the Old Testament. Jesus says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The time of his visitation is the last three years that he has been publicly teaching and preaching and, and setting up the kingdom. He is performing signs that confirm his uh, identity. But, but beyond just the recognition of the signs and the wonders, we see that Daniel was given the very date that the Messiah was going to be there in the nation in the time that he was going to be rejected. Now remember that Daniel lived in the time when the Babylonians had, had taken the nation of Israel into captivity. And so the, the people are captive and the nation has lost their land. The temple is destroyed and, and their land is destroyed. But God encourages them and lets them know that he's not done with them. And that they will go back into their land and they will reoccupy the land. And he gives Daniel now God's plan for the future of mankind. It's known as the 70 weeks in prophecy of how God is going to deal with the world for these final 70 weeks that is going to take place, these 70 weeks of, of years, the final 490 years that are going to transpire on the earth. And so in Daniel chapter 9, this is what God tells Daniel to write. 70 weeks or 70 sets of seven, so 490, are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, everlasting righteousness is going to take place when Jesus Christ rules and reigns in uh, righteousness. To seal up vision and prophecy, to fulfill all of it, and to anoint the most holy. And then he says this, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And so 69 sets of, of weeks or 483 years. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And when Nehemiah and Ezra go back, they have great difficulty in rebuilding, but it, it is rebuilt. And after the 62 weeks, that's the 7 plus the 62, after the 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. That word cut off means crucified. It means that he will be executed. And it says, but not for himself. In other words, not for anything that he did wrong himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And so 
Daniel had declared that from the time that the command to go back and rebuild is given, there's going to be 483 years until the time of the rejection of the Messiah. Now, Artaxerxes, you remember the Babylonians, they fell to the Persians and to Cyrus. And so the, the Persians take over. Now, the Persians, they had compassion on the Jews that had been taken into captivity in Babylon. And so they gave them permission to head back to their homeland and to rebuild their city. And so that decree was issued by Artaxerxes Longominus on March 5th, 444 BC, and that's what allowed them to return back and to build the second temple. And if you take that date when that command is given and you count forwards the 483 years that Daniel had recorded from the time at the end of your captivity in Babylon, when you're allowed to go back, count forwards 483 years until the time that the Messiah is going to be cut off or rejected by the nation. You come to the date of April 6, AD 32, which is the exact date that Jesus is making his triumphal entry to the nation. But because you did not know the time, you see, they didn't know the scriptures. What they knew was their traditions that they had built and all of the Pharisaical law. And this is what they were experts in, but they had stopped studying the actual scriptures themselves. And Jesus weeps because you did not know the time of your visitation, the destruction that is going to take place. In verse 11, and Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the, the temple we see that as he goes in, he ministers there at the temple. Matthew's gospel says the blind and the lame, the lame, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant the blind and the lame are now being healed there in Jerusalem. The people had recognized that the Messiah was here and, and Jesus now is touching them and, and healing them. And the religious leaders were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? And so when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, Mark records, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Matthew says, then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. Jesus makes his triumphal entry and, and we hear the people crying out their hosannas. It's really that word hosanna I wanted to just key in as we close our our time together here. Hosanna is in two Hebrew words, Hoshiai na, Hoshiana. And that means save us now. That is the, the literal translation of those two words. And it was the cry of the people who were in trouble to their king. It was the, the cry of rescue, save us. There are enemies that are coming and, and we need your help. We need your protection. We are helpless against the, the enemy. And, and so the hosannas were a traditional cry of the people. But in later years kept on going, the hosanna, the cry to the king became one of just exaltation. It just became one of jubilee, of excitement, of success, of victory, of, uh, of prosperity. And, and so we have this dual meeting of the word hosanna. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and, and there are the people crying hosanna. And it got me to thinking, hosanna, save Save us, save me from the enemy that is overwhelming me. And I began to recognize that that's the cry of every single person when they get saved. You cried out, Hosanna. You cried out to the Lord, save me. When you began to recognize that sin and death 
were going to swallow you up and you were going to be eternally separated from God and you were helpless against sin and death and the power of the grave. And you cried out, Hosanna, save me! And the Lord entered into your heart, washed away your sins and, and forgave you. And you enthroned Jesus as the son of David, as the Messiah upon your heart. And so, Hosanna. To those that are unsaved, may this be the day that your heart cries, Hosanna. The day that you make that decision to answer the question of who is Jesus, that you answer that you are the Son of God, that you are the Savior of the world, and you invite him into your heart and into that relationship. But Hosanna is also the cry for every saved person whose life is in a great state of compression. You might be here today, and, and today you may be facing tremendous trials, tremendous difficulties. They might be at your work, or they might be in your finances, or they might be in your health, or they might be in your relationship, in your marriage. It might be with your prodigal children, or, or in any other way that your life is just at this point where, where you have a situation, a circumstance that is beyond your capacity to be able to deliver yourself. And so you can cry, Hosanna, to the same Lord that entered into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago has entered into our sanctuary this morning. Jesus promises that where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst. And as Jesus has entered into this place today, there is access unto him that you can cry, Hosanna, save me, deliver me, help me, Lord, help me. He is an ever-ready help in time of need. And you just need to lift your Hosanna, the cry of your heart, to rescue you, to help you. Today you may be in a, a sweet place. Today you may not be compressed by the circumstances in life and God has blessed you and you are just enjoying, enjoying a rich time of communion and fellowship with the Lord. And, and if that's where you are today, then let your heart cry out, Hosanna. The cry of exaltation, the cry of thanksgiving, the cry of, of blessing, of, of welcoming, of rejoicing and how good our God is. A time of recognizing what was your life before the king showed up in your life. And how good is your life now that the king is in your life. The hosannas of the hearts. And today, let every single one of us lift our hosannas. If you don't know the Lord, let your hosanna be the cry of welcoming into your heart. If you know the Lord and you're pressed, may your heart's cry of Hosanna be for help, for aid, for assistance, for deliverance. And, and if you're in a place of great blessing, then let your Hosanna be simply a shout of praise and thanksgiving and glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is coming again, who will rule in righteousness and reign over the entire earth that every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus and Christ is Lord. To all glory be to God. Amen and amen and amen and amen. And let's pray. Father God, thank you. Lord, we ask that you would just meet us in a mighty way, in a powerful way, God, today, that we would just stop and pause and and that the cry of our heart would truly be in Hosanna. Bless us, Lord, this holy week. May we draw near to you, Lord. And Father, may our hearts give honor and praise and glory to you. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.